BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Alright, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. First, I would like to give one announcement. A big thank you to the Lawrence Kane WordPress for helping to promote Black Box Online Radio and featuring a link to this YouTube channel on that site. And if you haven't read the Lawrence Kane WordPress yet, I cannot recommend it enough. If you're curious about the Zodiac Killer suspect, Lawrence Kane, or just looking into a different window into the true crime world, I highly recommend the Lawrence Kane WordPress. I've used it so many times for uh, episodes on this channel. I have a couple episodes about Lawrence Kane that also have promoted it, so especially the episode Lawrence Kane Criminal History that you can hear on Black Box Online Radio. But one more time, please uh, visit the Lawrence Kane WordPress and give a big thank you to Travis, who runs that site. Moving on to today's topic, we're going to be going back to 1951 to explore some connections to a Zodiac Killer suspect that I've never mentioned before on this channel. And his name is Frank Dryman, but in many sources he's often been referred to as Frank Valentine. He's a man who didn't always have a single identity. In fact, he changed identities multiple times in his life, and the easiest way to title this episode was to say Frank Dryman Valentine. Those are two of the more famous aliases that he used. The third alias that is perhaps the most famous is changing his name to Victor Houston, and we will get to that later, but he went by Frank Dryman, and then Frank Valentine, and then later on, Victor Houston. Frank Dryman was someone who is connected to the Zodiac Killer mystery because of another Montana connection. The original title for this episode was going to be Zodiac Killer, the Deer Lodge Prison Connection, and I wanted to do something that was focused more on the activities in Deer Lodge Prison, particularly the 1959 prison riot, which Frank Dryman was in, uh, incarcerated during that time. Excuse me if I misspoke, but um, the there's something that is just so overwhelming about all of these stories because with the Zodiac Killer suspects that have a connection to Deer Lodge Prison in Montana, the most notable ones are Donald Lee Booyak, whom I have two episodes about here on this channel, Ed Edwards, whom I have zero episodes about, and Frank Dryman. Ed Edwards is a Zodiac Killer suspect whom I haven't talked about a lot before because I simply thought there was nothing there. I thought it was blowing things out of proportion, and um, you can hear countless things online about Ed Edwards and the Zodiac Killer connections, particularly a solution to the Z-13 cipher, or even better than that. If you go over to the Opperman Report, hosted by Ed Opperman, he likes to talk more about the outrageous Zodiac Killer suspects like Ed Edwards and George Hill Hodel, if you listen to some of the interviews with his guests. He'll have some things on that. I haven't done an episode on Ed Edwards because I just thought that it would it was unnecessary. I don't believe he had anything to do with the Zodiac Killer mystery, and um, I don't think that I would be sharing too many valuable ideas about him. Perhaps we could do one on Ed Edwards as an overall serial killer or just a true crime persona. That might be something valuable for the Anything Goes segment on Friday. But we said Donald Lee Booyak, Ed Edwards, and Frank Dryman, also known as Frank Ballantyne. It really is just impossible to even spend an hour talking about all three of these guys. Everyone would need their, their own hour-long segment. And I would like to introduce uh, some of the material surrounding Frank Dryman as a Zodiac Killer suspect from a particular article that was written in the Billings Gazette in 1969 and the one and one thing i'll say before that is 
Deer Lodge Prison becomes connected to the Zodiac Killer mystery because on September 27th of 1969, it's possible that Brian Hartnell, the surviving victim of the Lake Berryessa stabbing, reported that the Zodiac Killer said that he had escaped from Deer Lodge Prison, or that even if Brian's memory has faltered somewhat, that there is some connection to Deer Lodge Prison in Montana, and also that this person may have killed a prison guard while escaping. But I would like to uh, read this article from the Billings Gazette, and, uh, and thank you to Siegel, who has posted this on the internet. And I also see the, um, a post um, that Siegel has shared promoting the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders website. So um, if you're affiliated with that one, thank you for contributing there as well. Billings Gazette, January 8, 1969. Shelby Slayer is released. After serving 13 years in the Montana State Prison, 36-year-old convicted killer Frank Dryman of Shelby is set free. He has been released on parole to California, where he has a job working for his brother in a furniture store. Dryman was convicted of the shooting on April, the shooting death on April 4, 1951, of Clarence Pellet of Oilmont. Pellet had given Dryman a ride when Dryman was 19 years old and hitchhiking. The boy shot and killed Pellet at his first new trial. Dryman was convicted and sentenced to hang at the gallows, and then was moved to Shelby for the execution. However, he appealed and the Montana Supreme Court ordered a new trial. The new trial was in Haver. Haver, excuse me. There was that um, one video online that you can hear that mispronounces it. That's why I said Haver. But um, Haver, Montana. Some people would be very upset with me if I mispronounced that one. The new trial was set to be held in Haver, and Dryman received a life sentence, making him eligible for parole after twelve and a half years. He applied for parole in 1966, but he was denied, as the state parole board received letters of protest before the Toole County officials and others. He applied again, and this time the parole board released him to California. Toole County officials weren't even aware of the parole until after the fact. When they inquired, the parole board said, 13 years in prison had made Dryman a different man. After looking into the life of Frank Valentine, a.k.a. Frank Dryman, that is an absolute nutshell version, but it's good to have these um, sources that have been posted online. Thank you to the Billings Gazette for that article. But what happened is, you heard that there's the name of this man who was killed in 1951, and his name is Clarence Pellet. And there are a couple variants of the story, and even Frank Dryman has now passed away, but I don't even know if he remembered too clearly. However, the one is that there's this snowstorm. Sometimes it's described as a blizzard, other times it says it's just started snowing and then the dirt is still fresh on the ground. Clarence Pellet offers a ride to Frank Dryman. Out of pity, feels sorry for him, sees a young person, age 19 years old, and Clarence Pellet was a very chatty guy, talking a lot, and they, according to the legend, that even infuriated Dryman even more. So he pulled out a forty-five caliber handgun, he demanded the car, and Pellet's money. Pellet gave him the keys and his money, got on his knees, begged for his life, and then that absolutely did not satisfy Frank Dryman. He fired a shot, and I think the first shot actually missed. So then Clarence Pellet got up and he tried to run, and then Frank Dryman unloaded his forty-five into Clarence Pellet's back. And then once Pellet fell on the ground, he kept shooting, and I believe he fired seven shots in total, but he shot him directly on top of him, because when they removed Clarence Pellet's body from the ground in Montana, then they had to dig one foot into the soil. I mean, even after the snowstorm, they had to dig one foot into the soil to remove the slugs from the gun that had been fired, and they were just so shocked by the amount of blood that had been present. And even to... um even those seven shots, though, didn't kill Clarence Pellet immediately. He died from blood loss. He wasn't dead when he hit the ground, and he had to bleed out into the snow. Sounds absolutely heinous and very, very tragic. 
And the material that I was citing just there comes from a video presentation from someone who was Clarence Pellet's own grandson, Clem, Clem Pellet. And he has an excellent video out online that is put out on the Montana Historical Society's YouTube channel. And he also has written a book called Dastardly. And the video, though, if you would like to hear, is Dastardly, the true story behind the novel. And we'll talk more about his book in one second. But um, because this is a Zodiac Mondays episode, is it possible at all that this guy, Frank Dryman, could have been the Zodiac killer? You may have heard if I was reading from an article that said he got paroled in January of 1969, then, well, the first Zodiac crime occurred on December 20th of 1968, and even on this page, Tapa Talk, they're talking about that, and Tahoe 27, of all people, says it's possible that the Lake Herman Road murders were not genuine Zodiac activity. In some way, somehow, somebody obtained the information that they included in the first Zodiac killer letter, and then they simply took credit for that one as a way to confuse the authorities, because after Lake Herman Road on December 20th of 1968, there's the Blue Rock Springs shooting that occurred on July 4th of 1969. There's that seven-month gap. Is the, is the explanation for that someone didn't actually commit that crime? Some way, somehow, they learned about the info then that may have come from reading a police report, talking to somebody in law enforcement, or some way, somehow, they got that information, and then they put it into a Zodiac Killer letter. And then they committed the crimes, the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th, the Lake Berryessa stabbing on September 27th, and the Paul Stein murder on October 11th, and then writing the letters and the ciphers. I think the only things that Frank Dryman has going for him as a Zodiac Killer suspect is that he was in the state of California at the time. That's number one, and Unlike some of these other people who have been connected to Deer Lodge Prison, he gets out of prison on parole, and then he's sent to California. I believe they actually put him on a bus, and they sent him to Southern California to work, as you heard, with his uh, brother selling furniture. But the strikes against him would be not only the um, location. Well, what really else would there be? I mean, like, is everybody in California also a suspect? When you look at Frank Dryman compared to the composite sketch, I'm noticing some things that really are quite different about him. Firstly, I think that um, his jawline and his chin are strikingly similar, but um, the things that I notice to be different is he has a nose that is much wider, and just overall, that nose is much larger than the Zodiac Killer composite, which was done after the Stein shooting. His hairline is also much more intense. And um, I was discussing this with Kevin Robert Brooks, who is the guy behind the Montana Connection, looking at Donald Lee Booyak as a Zodiac suspect, not Frank Valentine. And he is um, pointed out that it's not really a widow's peak that, that we're talking about. It's a receding hairline of sorts. And this um, receding hairline on Frank Dryman is much more intense. His ears, though, are very, very similar to that composite. The brow ridge, I mean, like the areas right under the eyes, the whole of that really is um, quite shocking, though. But um, as far as a hair color goes, he's, his hair color is definitely a darker brown, not the reddish brown or the lighter blonde that has been described by Zodiac Killer suspects. Now... About the parole that Frank Valentine had and getting out of jail, I read in another source that he actually had the parole hearing in November of 1968, and that, that, that is well before the Lake Herman Road murders in December of 1968. And in that um, presentation that, um, that Clem Pallet gave about his grandfather, he said one of the reasons why Frank Valentine was granted parole is Clem Pallet's fa own father was not able to attend the hearings because he had passed away. At the first hearing, Clem Pallet's father was someone who adamantly protested against, against um, Frank Dryman Valentine being paroled. 
he was the family giving the impact statement, the family member giving the impact statement, excuse me, and he was talking about how his father's death had affected him, and um, he was denied parole that time, but Clem Pallet's father had passed away from a heart attack recently, um, well, I mean, recent to the contemporary times for them, prior to that hearing in 1968, so they didn't have anyone else attending, and no one was able to uh, to give a family impact statement, and it's possible that that was a big reason why he was granted parole and then was able to get out of prison. Part of me wants to suspect that Frank Dryman Valentine becomes a Zodiac Killer suspect because there is that parole hearing that occurred in November of 1968, and then people are kind of ignoring this um, article that says that he was paroled in January of 69. But if you heard the article that I was reading off just there, I mean, that's just the publication date. Most people, though, I'm, I mean, I, I don't see anybody disputing that. I mean, so it, it must be somewhat of an accepted fact that he was paroled in January of 69. There's actually a very big story, though, behind um, all the activities surrounding that uh, parole hearing, um, because um, the man who was murdered, Clarence Pallet, he had other children. At the time of his death, he had six children and 16 grandchildren. But the long story short is that um, the family became very divided after the death of um, of Clarence Pallet, and I will just leave it there. I would recommend that you uh, visit um, the writings and the presentation of Clem Pallet, Clem C. Pallet, which you can find on YouTube to hear all of those reasons about why the family would have separated. But then, how likely is it that this guy would have gone on to commit the Zodiac crimes? I will share one more thing with you that is relevant to all of the Zodiac Killer Montana connection issues. And that involves some profiling in a manner of speaking. I was talking about this with Drew Beeson, who's the author of the book Citing In on the Zodiac Killer. And Citing In on the Zodiac Killer has three major sections. The first is talking about a case made for Drew Beeson's suspect, Donald Lee Cheney. The middle section is like suspect profiles, talking about the um, likelihood or relevance that somebody would have to the Zodiac Killer mystery, trying to weigh out the material like we do here on Black Box Online Radio. And then the final section is more of a review of the primary source documents, some of the letters, the Halloween card, and so on. But there's a, there's a section in there on Donald Lee Bouillac, and I was talking about that with Drew Beeson recently, someone who else is connected to Montana, to this prison, and he said Donald Lee Bouillac was a thug. He wasn't somebody who was this type of genius criminal mastermind. He wasn't like someone who had orchestrated a brilliant crime, because Donald Lee Bouillac was convicted for the 1957 murder of Otto Fossen, which is really quite similar. He was actually, Bouillac stole a car, and then he was on the run. He was also hitchhiking, trying to get away from somebody, and then he was um, accosted by the sheriff's deputy, Otto Fossen, and they ended up getting into a scuffle. Bouillac shot him five times. The bullets penetrated Fossen's chest and neck, and then um, Fossen died on the way to the hospital, if I recall correctly. But, I mean, Drew Beeson's response was, that guy's a thug. He's not someone who was any type of super genius who would have created a criminal masterpiece filled with mathematical signatures. In turn, what do we make of some guy like Frank Valentine? He seems to be someone who was a thug, who was trying to steal a car and get away with it. He was someone who didn't show a very high regard for the laws, also somebody who thought that he was so arrogant that he didn't have to pay attention to the laws. He definitely killed, um, killed Clarence Pallet in cold blood, and one of the most disturbing things that you can read about when you look into the murder of Clarence Pallet is that he unloads the clip. He's shooting Clarence Pallet in the back, gets over him, shoots him some more, and then because it's snowing outside, he takes the warm barrel of the gun and he presses his hands against it because he just wants to feel the warmth because it's cold outside. I mean, he's already stolen the man's money and car, murdered him. He's like, oh, my hands are cold. That's all he's thinking about. Very, very heinous 
crime, but at the same time, the guy's still mostly a thug. Definitely not some type of um, brilliant criminal genius who would go on to create a criminal masterpiece loaded with mathematical signatures. If you'd like to hear more about um, Drew Beeson's responses to the other suspects, once again, his book is called Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer. He also hosts a show on YouTube called The Zodcast. Right now, I would like to go over to ZodiacKillerSite.com and giving a shout out to Tahoe27 who posted the Frank Dryman Timeline. Frank Dryman was born on June 4th, 1931 in Napa, California. On June 5th of 1948 to June 7th of 1949, the U.S. Navy stationed him on the USS Princeton. This is when I believe he actually started using the name Frank Valentine. That, I mean, it's really quite shocking to some guy like me in 2021 that you could join the Navy un under a fake name. But, um, yes, and uh, 48 to 49, if I recall what Clem Pallet has shared is that Frank Dryman uh, actually had gotten into some legal trouble, and they said that um, you're either going to jail or you can join the Marine Corps. And he agreed to join the Marine Corps, except he put his own twist on the punishment, and he actually enlisted in the Navy. And um, that, to me, just seems like some type of power-tripping individual that just wants to get away with... Um, things, but uh, people seem to turn a blind eye to it, and this is going to be very important, joining the Navy under the name Frank Valentine, because on, oh, let's just go to the next thing on the timeline. August 2nd, 1951, he set out to hitchhike to Canada from Reno, Nevada. April 4th, uh, did I say August? It says April. I think I said August. April 2nd, 1951 was when he set out to hitchhike to Canada from Reno, Nevada, so he gets into Montana. April 4th, yeah, we're in April, hope that's clear, he shoots and kills Clarence Pellet. April 5th, he is arrested in Canada and returned to Shelby. What I believe he actually did was, so he's hitchhiking, right, and it's snowing, he steals Clarence Pellet's car, and he drives to the Canadian border. But then even he is aware that he can't take the car across the border. That'll be just incriminating. So he crosses the border on foot, and then he goes into this motel, and it's snowing outside, and he doesn't um, even have money for a room, but someone else takes pity on him and allows him to sleep in the lobby, but then he tries to get back into America, and he's apprehended, or somewhere thereabouts he is apprehended. I don't want to get ahead of myself and say something that I'll regret. April 11th, he pleads guilty to killing Pellet, without counsel and later sentenced to hang. And the uh, shocking thing is he was sentenced to hang twice for this murder. Both times it didn't happen. May 31st gets reprieve. February 16th, 1952, wins appeal to the Montana Supreme Court for a new trial. January 5th, 1953, found guilty. On January 13th, he's sentenced to hang for the second time. January 30th, 1953, the appeals conviction, which is eventually reversed by the state Supreme Court, February 15th of 55, goes to trial in Hill County, found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. And the reason why they um, commuted the sentence isn't only because of the new trial. Some social activists also demanded it, and there's another big story behind this. There was some someone who was just trying to make a name for himself also got behind the case, but um, social activists demanded that he not get the death penalty. Now, January 7th, 1969, paroled from Deer Lodge to family in California. So there it is again in the timeline. I still think, though, that some people might just be looking at the original um, parole hearing that occurred on in November of 1968, and they're thinking, oh, okay, so he was paroled in November of 68. Well, it seems like that's when the hearing was. It seems like he almost definitely got out of jail in January of 69. And about Deer Lodge Prison, this is the Montana State Penitentiary, as far as I understand, but it's just located in Deer Lodge, Montana. August 30th, 1971, disappears in California, leaving wife and stepchildren behind. So he gets out. He's paroled, right? But he doesn't follow through with it because, I mean, he's on probation. He's not checking in with anything. And then he disappeared. Well, what on earth happened to this guy? What did he do? And um, 
Well, let's just keep going with this, and we will do that right after this quick message. You are listening to Black Box Online Radio. This show is brought to you by Teespring. Feel free to check out the merchandise. Almost all sizes and colors are listed. Black Box Online Radio. And remember, YouTube Premium. You can download the show, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. Please like and subscribe. Grazie mille. Okay, hello everybody, and we are back. As we continue to look at the life of Frank Dryman, also known as Frank Valentine, I said that there was a third alias that he tended to use, and this is the one that perhaps he used the longest, and it is the name Victor Houston, sometimes simply referred to as Vic Houston or Victor H. Houston, and it was one of the first sources that I ever pulled up on out of google.com but it said that he just pulled the name out of thin air and i always wondered about that like what maybe you've even seen this like when you look at the fbi top 10 most wanted list and the aliases that they suspect that these criminals might be using are so similar to their legal name you're thinking like hmm why is john smith trying to call himself john smithers you would think that somebody would just pull up a name out of thin air. Like if your name is Frank Dryman, you're going to say your name is Victor Houston. And then you're just going to accept it and you're going to go with it and you're going to be Victor Houston. And that's exactly what happened with Frank Dryman. I mean, he had had multiple aliases in his life. He was something that he could do. But does anybody notice, though, that disappearing in 1971 seems strangely similar to the lack of Zodiac activity going on surrounding the, um, well, I mean, it's well after the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 69, but also the Zodiac communications all cease. And then where is Frank Dryman going to? Arizona. And he stayed there until he was apprehended in 2010. The true claim to fame that Frank Dryman Valentine has in the true crime world is that he was the longest absconding fugitive in Montana state history. He had disappeared, and he was a wanted man longer than anybody in the state of Montana's history, which is quite shocking in its own right. And I found this article from CBS News that talks about the arrest of Frank Dryman in 2010. The aging Frank Dryman, a notorious killer from Montana's past, had hidden in plain sight for so long that he had forgot that he was a wanted man. In an exclusive jailhouse interview with the Associated Press, Dryman detailed how he invented a whole new life in Arizona with a new family, an Arizona wedding chapel business, and even a volunteer work group for local civic clubs. They just forgot about me, said Dryman in his first interview since being caught and sent back to prison. He had to the prison he has last left in the 1960s. Yes, he actually did go back to Deer Lodge Prison. I was a prominent member of the community. That is, until the grandson of the man he shot six times in the back came looking. As I said about the seven shots, the first shot that was fired at um, Clarence Pallet missed, and then he unloaded and shot him six times. Dryman had been one step ahead of the law since 1951 when he avoided the hangman's noose, a relic of frontier justice still in use at the time. Well, it's really not that he was um, evading the law then. It, he was apprehended very shortly after the uh, murder of Clarence Pallet. And um, the way that they found Clarence Pellet's body, actually, was a sheep herder was out with his uh, flock, and he noticed that a lot of buzzards had been, like, circling in the air, like scavenger birds. So he thought that one of the sheep may have um, gotten away and that it might have passed away. So once he approached, he then saw that it was a human, and it was the body of Clarence Pellet. So then he alerted the sheriff. Less than 20 years later, he was out on parole, not content with the good fortune. He skipped out and evaded the authorities for four decades. So, of course, breaking the agreements, not checking in with the parole officer, he had skipped out. Evaded the authorities for four decades, and after a while, forgot about it and ended up signing up for VA, that's Veterans Affairs Benefits, from his Navy days in 1948. But whose name is on those Veterans Affairs Benefits? Frank Valentine. That's how they caught him. Now the 79-year-old Dryman is back behind bars, likely for what remains the rest of his life. He was caught only 
Um, he was caught only after his long-ago victim's grandson got curious and started poking around. Tryman was hitchhiking a ride from Shelby Cafe owner Clarence Pellet on a cold and snowy day in 1951 when he pulled a gun and ordered Pellet give him his car and money and began firing. And um, as we said, Pella gets out of the car, he gets on his knees, he pleads for his life, the first shot's fired, and then Pella gets up and runs, so then he shoots him six more times. The majority of the shots were done over Clarence Pellet's body, almost like overkill. I mean, all of it was overkill, to be honest, and it, and it was all gratuitous. It was because um, this guy, Frank Dryman Valentine, thought that he could get away with it and that he was... um just doing something evil because he believed he could, he, he had the power to do so. Dryman does not deny the crime, just that he's not the same man. He has been Victor Houston for decades. At the time of the murder, after being discharged from the Navy for mental issues, he was going by the name Frank Valentine. That kid, Frank Valentine, he just exploded, Dryman says, of his own crimes. I didn't shoot that man in the back. That wild kid did. That's not me. Um, yeah, I think O.J. Simpson did something similar. Charlie did it. And I shouldn't even have said that. I digress. Victor Houston tried to make up for it by being an honorable citizen. Dryman says he served time, which he did until paroled, but the Montana Parole Board was not accustomed to leniency on those who walk away from supervision and was not impressed with Dryman's subsequent good deeds. Last month, the board sent him back behind bars to serve what remains the rest of his life. Now, when we talk about true crime cases here on this channel, I always want to try and empathize with the victims and the family members and those whom are even connected to the uh, perpetrators in this. How would the innocent family member feel if they were in this situation? But I cannot even begin to imagine what that would be like when maybe you're at the breakfast table or you get a phone call or someone just happens to tell you that your father isn't who he says he is. Oh yeah, your father's name isn't what you think it is. It's actually Frank Dryman. And yeah, he's a convicted murderer and he's been lying to you your entire life. And now he's going back to jail and um, your whole like world is going to be t turned upside down. I don't even know the types of emotion that I would experience if that happened to me, or, I mean, I can't even begin to comprehend, like, the emotional preparation associated with that, but that is quite shocking. At this time, though, I would like to ask you, do you believe that he should have been sent back to jail for the rest of his life? This article is from 2010, and Frank Dryman went on to pass away in 2017. He was 86 years old, and he died from natural causes in prison behind bars. Do you believe that he should have been sent back if I have to take a hard stance on the subject, I would say absolutely. He committed the crime, and he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. He did 13 years in prison, and then he was um, given the opportunity to get out. But then he fled. He took off. He had so many chances, and even at the age, even like in his late 70s and early 80s, at that point, Someone just has to finally say that we're not going to let convicted murderers get away with things. But what would you think? I would love to see your responses in the comments section below. Dryman said that he disappeared from parole in California to get away from a wife he didn't like. What? That's ridiculous. I mean, that may be the most ridiculous excuse I've ever heard. Oh, dear. He said he's not sure why he didn't just leave the wife or remain on parole. Yeah, you think? But once gone, he said he didn't look back. His new wife and family knew nothing of his past. He put down roots in Arizona City, painting signs, a train he learned in prison, and performing weddings. As we said, he was running a chapel. Well, uh, I'd like to give a, uh, give a give the source cited here this one more time. CBS News, four decades, fugitive. I'd forgotten I was wanted. And it's important to remember that he was forgotten. He had forgotten that he was wanted because he was claiming those Veterans Affairs benefits under the name Frank Valentine. This one was published by the Associated Press as well, June 15th, 2010. So, I did mention that in addition to hearing 
Clem Pellet's presentation, that's the grandson, which is on the uh, Montana Historical Society YouTube channel. It's very good. I can not recommend it enough. He does have a book out that is called Dastardly. The story is fiction. The evil is real by Clem C. Pellet. And um, when it when it says that it's a novel, some of the names have been changed. The drifter is named Andrew James Carmichael. But I would like to um, read the description of the book that has been posted on Amazon.com. And um, I hopefully will get a chance to read this as soon as possible. Dastardly is based on the following true story. Accidentally running across 60-year-old newspaper articles was how I learned details of my grandfather's murder. Shot in the back seven times by a hitchhiker, from the clippings I learned the shooter was captured on April 5th, 1951, the day after his dastardly deed. Um, the dastardly deed, I think, was uh, something that uh, Frank Dryman used to refer to it as, like, what he had done in the past was the dastardly deed. His arrest was followed by four years of highly contentious appeals, trials, and what my grandfather, her Shelby friends and relatives considered legal shenanigans. Saving him from Montana's galloping gallows on more than one occasion, attorney Jerry J. O'Connell adroitly defended this confessed murderer, winning a life sentence. O'Connell was a communist activist worthy of J. Edgar Hoover's personal attention. The fight between rural Montana frontier justice and McCarthy-era progressives captured the nation's attention. Later paroled in 1969, the killer absconded and remained at large for almost four decades. But um, as you heard, um, he does go to California first, and it does, he, he even got married to that wife that he said that he was running away from. He doesn't um, abscond until 1971, according to that timeline that was posted on ZodiacKillerSite.com. And um, this also states that he was paroled in 1969. I really do think people are looking at that November hearing that, that took place, and um, they're saying that's before the Lake Herman Road murders of 68. In April 2009, while clearing out my mother's home after her passing, I discovered 60-year-old newspaper clippings concerning the murder. From these, I found the murderer's name, and to my astonishment, I learned that he had been a fugitive on law enforcement's radar for almost four decades. That was it for me. The search was on, finding this murderer because became my cause. Th through determination and persistence and hard work, and I have to admit, a bit of serendipity as well. A year later, I found success. I found the longest standing absconder in Montana history. And as it says here one more time, um, the book is called Dastardly, and it's by Clem C. Pellet, available on Amazon.com. There's some big Zodiac Killer questions that we can ask in this one. The first is, is it possible that the Zodiac Killer did not commit the Lake Herman Road murders? in December of 1968. Some other people that would think that this could be true would be anyone who is looking at Richard Gajkowski or Bruce Davis as a Zodiac Killer suspect, and they don't like it when people explore this angle, but did someone just commit the crime and then later on that suspect learned about it? It is possible that Richard Gajkowski was in Ireland at the time of the Lake Herman Road murders, it's possible that Bruce Davis was in England at the time of the Lake Herman Road murders, or maybe they weren't, maybe they came back to America. But it's something that's been widely discussed. Were the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen committed by a different person? And then another suspect shot Darlene Farron on July 4th, stabbed Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard on the 27th of September, and murdered Paul Stein on October 11th of 69. I suppose anything is possible, but the Zodiac did state those facts that only I and the police know. So talking about the placement of the bodies, the brand of the ammo, that is not looking good for somebody like Frank Valentine, in terms of anyone who is actually trying to connect him to the Zodiac killer mystery. I mean, th those are all strikes against him. I'm, I've debated, though, very, very heavily about the Lake Herman Road murders being genuine a activity. I said Tahoe 27 posted that, and even during the last AMA when somebody asked that question, which Zodiac Killer crime do you find the most mysterious, I said the Lake Herman Road murders, because there's such a high possibility that it could have been a drug-related or gang-related shooting, and that gang would be 
the Ott Brothers gang. I had previously thought that that was the Hell's Angels, but it appears that there's this small intermediary gang that is working between the Hell's Angels and the nickel and dime dealers who apparently infiltrated David Faraday's high school. And one of the things that David Faraday do had done, had done, excuse me, to um, aggravate the gang was that he was going to rat out one of the drug pushers at his high school. And that could have caused a whole pile of problematic issues for them. So they they retaliated and they had David Faraday murdered. Or the more conventional narrative is just, there's a single Zodiac killer and he um, murdered David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. He murdered Darlene Farron, Cecilia Shepard, and Paul Stein. And that's how things happened, and that he wasn't in Montana. And I forgot to say the, the absolute most important thing that I read in the book, citing it on the Zodiac Killer. I mean, of course, it's um, drawn upon from some other sources, but I mean, one point that Drew Beeson really wants to share with us is that Brian Hartnell was not completely sure about this Deer Lodge prison connection. I mean, I just thought Drew Beeson laid it out so clearly when he said, Brian Hartnell's response to the Deer Lodge prison issue is, he was talking to this guy, the Zodiac Killer, that is, and he's saying something like he escaped from some prison. It sounded something like Fern Feathers or Fernlock or something with a double name. Maybe it was something like in Colorado or... Montana, and one of the detectives suggested, was it Deer Lodge Prison in Montana? And the, more or less, the detective force-fed that into Brian's memory, and Brian said, I think that could be it. Now, one of the things that um, I was hoping to do more in this episode was to talk about the 1959 Deer Lodge Prison riot, because it made the national news. I mean, this was one thing that um, Tom Boyd had shared that, um, I mean, this is more or less his analysis rather than mine, that somebody could have learned about that and then been using that as some type of of info or they could have um, force fed that to the victims instead of the victims for getting it from the detectives. But I'm not 100% sure. My, my first response was, is this guy just talking about the 1959 prison riot, meaning the Zodiac killer at Lake Berryessa? He has a gun drawn on Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, and he says, I escaped from a prison in Montana, Deer Lodge Prison. Is he saying that because of the news reports about the 1959 prison riot? The first thing is, 10 years have passed, 1959 to 1969. Is somebody really remembering some old news reports that they heard 10 years prior and that they just have this fantasy of being some jerk who escaped from prison and they want to put on this persona? Would the Zodiac Killer do that? Absolutely, yes. 100% yes. That's something the Zodiac Killer would do. Look at all the other references that are found from literature and art and film and books and magazines and comic strips. All of these things, and I have to give a shout out to Playtime, who just shared something with me recently, talking about how there are these clues um, that are found in To Kill a Mockingbird, and um, from Harper Lee, and uh, Playtime actually shared um, an article from ZodiacCiphers.com, so also giving credit to Richard Grinnell, and um, I highly recommend that uh, you read those things, so if you ever just go into Google ZodiacCiphers.com and then you put in the To Kill a Mockingbird clues, I'll talk more about that in the AMA, but the whole point is, this is somebody who is getting these clues from various sources, and that should, that should not only be fictional sources, who's to say that this person wouldn't have obtained the information from news reports about the 1959 Deer Lodge prison riot? which did see the deaths of prison guards. If you read the Lake Berryessa transcripts, multiple times Brian Hartnell asked the Zodiac Killer, what was the name of that prison you, were, you just said? And he said, Deer Lodge. So I, I had always accepted that it was a fact that the guy came from Deer Lodge Prison, but um, it appears that the authorities may have um, altered Brian's memory, or he wasn't certain that that's what he heard. So... I mean, I was just exploring some possibilities right there. 
We should always remember that, though. If Brian Hardinal isn't completely certain that he heard Deer Lodge Prison at Lake Berryessa, I mean, these suspects like Frank Valentine, like Donald Lee Buyak, and like Ed Edwards would go a little bit downhill. And without any form of media or any other witnesses to corroborate this, it's um, it's really quite difficult to know the exact words that were uttered at Lake Berryessa because even if you do read the transcript, you will see that there is a gap in there that Brian Hartnell just simply wasn't aware of what the, um, oh, he had forgotten a certain segment from the Lake Berryessa transcripts. With somebody like Frank Valentine, also known as Frank Dryman, also known as Victor Houston, I think there's a horribly low chance that he was the Zodiac Killer. He seems like an impulsive criminal who's more about um, reinventing himself as opposed to committing a larger series of murders. As a, I mean, that's the thing, though. The crimes that were committed by Frank Valentine are about selfishness, the murder of Clarence Pellet, the, like, absconding, like, getting away from his parole officer, violating the parole agreements, going on the run. Those are all done to fuel his own selfishness. They aren't done to create any type of criminal master work. They aren't done to show off how smart he is. They're done because he wants to be on the run. Well, he doesn't want to deal with the current situation, so he ran away from it. The Zodiac didn't run away from things. No, the Zodiac plunged into things. The Zodiac could have committed murders and not taken credit for it. But the Zodiac chose to write letters and ciphers, to taunt the police, to make phone calls, to write on the car door at Lake Berryessa. The Zodiac did things to show criminal versatility. And it's not about selfishness. Arrogance, yes. Egoism, yes. But all of these taunts are done when the Zodiac had nothing to gain from it. Completely different thought patterns associated with the crimes of Frank Dram and Valentine. Some guy who's just like a criminal thug who wants to get away with stuff because he has impulse control, he's a deviant. And I would like to just share one last thing about this crime that was committed by Frank Dryman Valentine, the murder of Clarence Pellet in 1951. So there's a snowstorm, and he shoots Clarence Pellet, and he gets away. I am so um, curious if he just thought that there's no one that gonna there's no one that's around. I, I'm not going to get away with this crime. It's like, if he thought there were no consequences for his actions, he just um, acted that way. I was watching the movie once, There Will Be Blood, which I guess is like a Western. I mean, I don't know if everyone would call it a Western. But um, there is a scene, though, that appears to be Wild West, where a man just murders somebody, and then he buries his, the body in the ground, and he walks away, and he resumes his normal life. And I was thinking that, wow... I mean, in the older days, the cost of human life was rather low. People could commit crimes like that, and they could get away with it because no one was around to stop them. And I think that mindset has carried on into the 1950s with um, Frank Dryman Valentine. And also one thing you may have noticed is that Donald Lee Buyak and Frank Valentine were both hitchhikers. Um, they were both involved with hitchhiking, and um, that led to... Uh, the criminal activities around them, or they committed criminal activities on or about the time in which they were hitchhiking. I think that purely relates to the geography of the western part of the United States and Canada. Even to this day in the western parts of Canada, we have mysteries surrounding the Trail of Tears, or the Highway of Tears. I can't believe I said that. The Trail of Tears is going to Oklahoma in the mid-1800s. The Highway of Tears, and I do have one episode about the Highway of Tears, if I can get the name right, related to the death of Amber Tuckero, someone who was murdered on that highway because... The cities and the transportation centers are not very well connected in that part of the world. So one way that people can get from place to place is by hitchhiking. And I think it's the exact same thing that happened in Montana and with uh, both Donald Lee Buyak and with Frank Dryman Valentine. But what do you have to say about Frank Dryman Valentine? And if you want to share anything about the 1951 murder of Clarence Pellet, I would love to read your comments in there below. You can also respond to that challenge question. If you want to weigh in on anything about Frank Dryman Valentine as the a Zodiac Killer suspect, you can also share that um, 
always going to be listening and reading your comments, and hopefully they'll be used in a future AMA. They did try to make a movie called Pellet about um, the 1951 murder, as well as the whole story of um, his grandson, Clem Pellet, un uncovering all of this information. But um, I think it actually has been completed. But I was on IMDb, and I didn't see anything like a release date. If you go on YouTube, you'll see that there is a trailer that had been made for it, but other people have viewed it, and there's some news reports surrounding it. My guess is they got slowed down because of the coronavirus and the global pandemic, but I suppose... Anything is possible. There may be some other reasons. If you have anything to say at all, please put your ideas in the comments section below. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, blackboxned88. And there's a Facebook page for the show, Blackbox Online Radio. You can also get my personal Facebook page in the description box here. And I will see you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.